So well, hi everyone and welcome to today's SQL Office Hours session. As always, it's great to be here and help answer your questions about SQL. Now, in this session, we're going to start off by looking at a question that actually came in on Ask Tom, you know, the offline version of Ask Tom, um, a few weeks ago now. And someone was asking, how do they split rows into consistent buckets? Right. And this is an interesting question. The first most interesting part of it is, well, what exactly do they mean by consistent? There are several different ways you could interpret this question, and we're going to look at them as we go through this session. So, hi everyone, I'm Chris Saxon. I'm part of Gerald Wenzel's developer advocate team and part of the answer team on Ask Tom. It's my job to help you get the best out of Oracle Database and hopefully have a little bit of fun whilst doing so. So, with that in mind, it's always great to be here for the SQL Office our sessions and see you, well, I say see you, I can't really see you, you can see me, um, and actually talk about some SQL. So before we start talking about um, splitting rows up into buckets and so on and so forth, let's start with a slightly different question, because usually these, you if you're doing some data analysis or something like that, quite often someone will come to you and say something like, um, well, I want to know what the mean salary, the average salary is in across the company. And this is a really easy query to write in SQL. You just use the AVG average function, which returns you the arithmetic mean of the values. Nice and simple, but this doesn't actually tell us very much about the data, right? It just says, summed up all the sal salaries, divide them by how many values there are, how many employees, and that's the mean. And in some cases, this is very useful, but if you get this response, there's almost certainly a whole bunch of other questions you'll then want to know. Things like, well, what is the median salary? What, what's the highest salary? What's the lowest salary? Where do people fall within that spread? You know, how widely is this information spread? So we're going to look at some ways you can do that. And we'll start off by a very common kind of metric that people use when looking at demographic data, and that's splitting the data into quartiles or other kind of death aisle, uh, other aisles, you know. Um, basically, we're going to split them into even groups. So each group has the same number of rows in it, or as close to as we can get to the same number of rows. So with quartiles, we will split the rows up so there's 25% of them in each. And if we're doing some data visualization and things like that, most commonly, the most common type of chart you would use to represent this is a box and whisker plot, which would look a little bit like this. And you know, the kind of shaded green areas, they cover 50% of the values. So the kind of line we have here of 6,100, that's the median value, the middle one. That means half the people earn less than that and half the people earn more than that. And each of these boxes and then those lines represent a quarter of the people. So this tells us some interesting things, right? We can see that most people, you know, three quarters of the people earn less than 8,600, but, you know, a reasonable number earn more than that. And there's actually quite a very big spread, in fact, of the top 25% earners. They go right up to, you know, 24,000 or whatever the top value is. So we can see most people are kind of quite clustered together in the lower range, but there's a big spread in the higher range of values. So how can we write some SQL to generate, to form the data for something like this, the underlying information? And that's how you can do something like um, use the entile function, right? Um, so what this does is it splits the rows up into groups. So N here is how many groups that we actually want, um, and you know, can be any integer value that you want here. So the order by says we're going to sort the data according to whatever that expression is. So if we're going to do um, salaries, we're going to sort it um, by salary, and then if we're going to have four, so we'll take the bottom quarter, the top, bottom 25%, then next the median 50%, next 25%, and so on. Key thing with this is we are going to get the same number of rows in each group. Well, as close as we can get to the same number of rows in each group as we can as, as is possible, right? If the number of rows is not a multiple of four, you know, it's like 107 rows, 
that doesn't divide equally by four, um, some groups will have an extra row in them. But the key thing is there will only be a maximum of one row difference between each group. They'll all be as evenly spread as we can other than that. So this is useful if we want to split an equal size group. So the same number of rows or same number of people, whatever it is that it represents. And as I said, this kind of um, approach is very common for demographic data. You know, we say what the um, bottom quartile or the lowest 10% of people earn, what do the 1% at the top earn, that kind of thing. Um, those percentiles are very often used when discussing things like, um, you know, poverty rates and stuff like that. It's also really common for things like uh, exam results. Um, you may well have been told when you got your exam results that you were in the 75th percentile, the 90th percentile, and things like that. So if you're in the 90th percentile, that means you scored better than 90% of the people, right? Only 10% of people scored higher than you. So this is commonly used in a lot of domains, but then there's another approach and different ways um, we could represent this. So rather than kind of a box and whisker plot, another very common type of chart is a histogram. Now there's, there's actually lots of different types of histograms so, um, and subtle ways of doing them, but commonly, or the most basic, um, the most common usage of this is what we're doing is splitting the values up into equal intervals so that each box, you know, each um, section here covers the same number of values, okay? So if we produce our salaries as a histogram, then we can see um, most people, it's quite heavily skewed to the left. So most people are earning, you know, the, uh, the, lower values possible. We could kind of see that with a block, box and whisker plot, but um, I think, it depend, you know, some people see things in different ways. Um, it can, becomes very clear here that salaries are skewed to the bottom, and we can see there's only one person actually who earns in whatever this top range here is. And the key thing here is each of these things covers the same range of values, the same size of interval but we don't know how many values are going to be in them. There could be a different number of rows in each. So to generate something like this, we can use the width bucket function. And this has four parameters, the value that we're trying to figure out which bucket it is, the highest value of the chart, you know, the lowest possible, the highest possible value, and how many buckets you want. So we have those four. And then the database decides um, what the range of the intervals, how big the intervals are by taking the high value, subtracting the low, and then dividing by the number of buckets. So if we've got a value, values from zero to 100 and four buckets, zero minus 100 is 100, divide that by four, so each bucket will cover values, um, range of 25 values. So not to 25, 25 to 50. Now, an important thing to note here with width bucket is the intervals are Open, closed open, I should say. That means we're covering the lower bound is anything less than or equal to that lower bound and strictly less than the upper bound, okay? This is gonna be kind of important, particularly if it comes to having values that are outside the upper and lower bounds for your data, right? Um, I'll, we'll discuss that in a bit more detail in a minute. But when computing width bucket, it calculates the size of these intervals then looks at this value and says, which bucket does it belong in? So the first um, value will be the lowest value plus the interval of that size. And we'll see where the values fit within that. So this is, works really well when we've got um, numeric data. And so histogram is really common chart type to do things like see, you know, what the distribution of response times for queries are or web page loads, people's salary, people's ages, you know, what, um, how many people are affected by certain conditions, that kind of thing. So it's really well with numeric um, and time data as well. We can also use this with date times. But what if we want to do something slightly different? What if we want to split names up by split strings up, character data up? For example, maybe we want to produce a chart showing, um, excuse me, 
people's um, names by starting letter. So we'll say like A through to F have this many people starting with that name, then whatever, was it F, G, G through to um, the next letter and so on and so, so forth. So for each range of letters, how many people fall within that? So that would mean we're generating a chart that looks a bit like this. So we've got A through to G, H through to M, and N through to T, and so on and so forth. And then just how many names fall within that. So there'll be times when we've got character data and we want to split them into groups like this. Now, there's actually a few ways we can do this. Um, and one approach is we can use dense rank. So we'll sort the letter. We'll just extract the first letter of each thing use dense rank, um, and that means all the rows with the same starting letter will get the same rank, and there'll be no gaps in them. So we'll generate each value up to, from one to 26, okay? Now, this works well if we know we've got every letter in the series, or we've got other types of strings that we want to um, bucket together, okay? I'll come to an example of that in a minute. So we can use dense rank to map the values, and then we can pass that dense rank value into which bucket, saying the buckets from one to 27 and so on. Now, at this point, you might be looking a little bit and going, hang on, why have I gone one to 27? Because we've got 26, you know, and in, well, assuming you're working with the standard English alphabet, for example, and you've not got German or French or any of the other um, alphabets with diacritics in, we're just using basic English alphabet, there's 26 characters, so why have I gone 1 to 27? Well, remember what I was saying about um, the intervals. It's anything strictly less than that upper bound. If we do 1 to 26, then the last character, Z, will actually not go in the last bucket. We'll have to create an overflow bucket for it. So um, that's kind of an overview of how these all work. So at this point, I think it's worth showing these in action and going to a little demo um, and seeing how they actually work in practice. All right, and if you've got any questions or comments at this point, just let me know. I see someone saying that it, it was me, I guess you're saying it was you who asked this question about it. So um, if you've got further questions about this or this is helping explain for things further, that's great. Um, um, we can dive into more detail. All right. So um, I'm just going to use some randomly, a thousand randomly generated rows, and hopefully this will help illustrate some of the differences between these functions and the way they work. So you can see if I run this several times, we're going to get slightly different values. So 63, 17, 55, you know, 0, 91, 52, and so on. So this will help hopefully demonstrate the differences between how these functions work. So let's start off with our end tile. We're going to split things into quartiles. So we've got a thousand rows, end tile four, so sort um, four different buckets. Um, so we're going to expect a thousand divided by four, 250 rows in each group. And we run this and we'll see that's exactly what we've got 250 rows in each. And if we run this a few times, we should still see exactly 250 rows. But you'll notice these upper bounds or the boundaries shift slightly. So CMS random dot value is a uniform distribution. So all the values are equally likely. But of course, it's random. So it's not guaranteed that the 250th, 50th, while we expect the 250th, the 25% to be 25, 50, 75, and so on random data, so they're not going to be exactly it. So we see 23, 51, 76, and so on. So we run this a few times, 24, 49, 74. So those boundaries shift slightly every single time. Same number of rows each time, but what the size of those boundaries and where they exactly are changes slightly each time we execute this. So to help perhaps make this a bit more um, obvious is rather than a uniform distribution, I'm going to use the normal distribution for um, generating the data. So this will be our midpoint. Our mean is 50, and 10 is our standard deviation here. So we expect, uh, was it two thirds of the values between 40 and 60, and 95% of the values between 30 and 70. And if we run this, again, we'll see that. Yeah, we get exactly four, um, 250 rows in each group. But we can see these middle um, 
groups are much more much narrower they cover a much narrower narrower range because with our normal distribution most of the values are kind of in the middle you know we get that classic bell shape um, and there is a much wider spread in those values so we'll run it however we run it we'll get the same number of rows but exactly where these boundaries are will shift ever so slightly each time so that's if we're using n tiles the other approach we could take, as I say, is split them with consistent size, which we do with width buckets. So what we're doing is saying here, we've got the values 0 to 100, generate them. Um, so that gives us these intervals, 0 to 25, 25 to 50, and so on. And if we run this with our uniform distribution, we get roughly 250 rows in each group. Not exactly, but it's pretty close to that. Um, but because 25 is the upper bound for the first bucket, 50 is the upper bound for the second bucket, and so on, you'll see that we never generate a value higher than that for each one. So the highest value in each group is 25, 50, 75, and 100. Um, because it's random, we're not necessarily going to get exactly that value, but we'll never go beyond it like we did with n tile. All right? So we've run this a few times, just to kind of just prove that to you. So you can see what's going on. So you see, we never go beyond what these upper limits are. And if we do the same, we do a normal distribution again um, from zero to 100. We expect most of the values to be within these middle two buckets. And if we run this, that will be, there we go, exactly what we find. Because I said 95% of the values would be between 30 and 70. So almost, you know, uh, all except 14 in this fact. In fact, fall in these two middle buckets. So we fix the size of the buckets, but not how many rows go in each. So we can run that a few times, and you'll see that we get a uh, slightly different number each time. But again, the upper limits for these are fixed. Now, one of the interesting things with this kind of normal distribution is I put the values, the upper and lower values, as 0 and 100. Now, it is possible that the values might exceed that. It's quite unlikely, right? Um, but it is possible we'll get a negative value or a value beyond 100. And you can see actually most of the time I'm running this, the highest and lowest values are actually not even close to those limits at all, you know, 18, 70 something. But there might be times when you, um, rather than having a fixed upper and lower bound, you want to take generate them from the data itself, right? You just want to say, What's the smallest value? What's the highest value? Use those as the limits for our width bucket. Okay, um, so how do we do that? Well, it's pretty straightforward. We can use min and max as analytic functions. So we can just pass those into width bucket like this. And again, we'll get four things. Um, and those will set our higher and lower bounds. Now at this point, you'll notice I've added one to the um, upper bounds. Why? Well, remember, we're dealing with closed open intervals. So if the value is equal to that upper bound, it goes in the next bucket. So whatever the highest value is, um, will go in an overflow bucket if we don't increase this. Okay, I'll show you exactly what that means in a minute. So you can see we've kind of, um, because we're dynamically generating them now, we're actually slightly more evenly <laughs> spreading the values. Um, not exactly, but slightly more evenly. Uh, uh, so we can see how that works. But notice they fit in those four buckets. If I don't add one, I just leave it at zero. This means whatever that maximum is equal to the highest value. Um, so it goes in an overflow bucket. Um, so we'll see here, we get five buckets, right? So anything greater than or equal to this upper bound going a upper overflow bucket, and anything um, less than the lower bounds will go in an underflow bucket. Um, actually, I actually could show you that as well if I really wanted. I wasn't was thinking about that. There we go, we get an underflow bucket as well. Okay, so think carefully about what you want these limits to be. If you're generating them from the data themselves, you almost certainly want to add, um, you know, some unit of value data so that you include the values. There are situations where you know what range you want to cover, and if there are outliers, that's kind of interesting and you might want to see it. 
but if you're generating it from the data itself, you probably don't want to take the exact max. You probably want to uh, increase it slightly so that the whatever the top value is doesn't go in its own overflow bucket. So as I said, this works pretty well um, with numeric data, but what if we want um, character data, right? So this time I'm doing a similar thing, generating random data, but I'm just generating random strings. And you can see I'm taking the first letter and using that bench rank to assign them values one to 26. There we go, A through Z, like that. And then we can use this dense rank value to set the buckets, okay? So let's just kind of illustrate the purposes here. If I go a bit further down, I'll show you the complete query. So we're doing exactly the same thing I did, but we've set the limit from one to 27 because we want Z to be in, not an overflow bucket. And if we run this a few times, you see we've got A through J, G, H through M, N through T, and so on. So we've got six or seven rows in each bucket and how many strings there are corresponding to those. Now, um, one of the reasons you might want to do this is if you've got a, a smallish but a reasonable number of um, character strings. So if we take people's jobs. So there's 19 different jobs in the employees table. And we could use that to just create a standard bar chart, right? We can say um, for each of these jobs, have a separate bar in the, in the thing and how big it is. But 19 values is quite a lot to stick in one chart, right? It can get a bit hard to actually see what's going on. Um, so we might want to kind of group them together by character. And of course, we want to be sure all the rows for a particular job go in the same bucket. So we we'll see we've got five FI accounts, whatever that job is. Um, we don't want three of them to be in one bucket and two of them to be in the next bucket. We want to be sure all of them go in that same bucket. So we can use this dense rank option here to find out, um, to set those values, find out how many different ones there are. And here, because in general, we don't know how many there's going to be, we'll just take the maximum of this computed value. This gives us values one to N for however many different jobs there are, add one to that, to set our buckets, and then we can group by that. So we're grouping by which bucket um, to produce the breakdowns. So we'll see how many jobs there are, how many rows. And I'm using ListAg to just help, help you see um, how many values there are in each. So we get a comma separated list of each one. And you can see we've got our first set of jobs are all the ones starting with A, just the way it's worked out with this. And then we've got FI account through to MK man and so on and so forth. So this could be really useful if you've got you know, a fair number of different strings. If you've only got, you know, you're dealing with, let's say maybe currencies and your business only has a few. So euros, US dollars, maybe British pounds, maybe some of the um, minor um, European currencies you might only have five or six different values. If you're a true global company and you have currencies all around the world in your transactions, you know, there's, I forget how many currencies are, but there's a lot it's difficult to represent that in one chart. So you might want to bucket things together like that. This is useful if we've got strings that we want to kind of sort alphabetically and put into different groups. However, when dealing with character data in general, you do need to be kind of careful. Why? Well, let's, let's look at what happens with the HR data, the employee data, and I use that dense rank function that I was looking at a minute ago. So uh, something interesting is going on here, right? So what's going on here? Um, we've got first group covers A through H rather than A through G, all right? Um, and then I through N, then O to W. And hang on, I've asked for four groups, wherever we go the link, I've asked for four groups, but I've only got three. What's actually going on here? So what, what's the situation? Well, dense rank just sort the values and starts with one, all the rows with the same value get the same number, and then it leaves no gaps. So it'll always go one, two, three, four, up to however many different values we've got here. So we've only got letters O through to W, or A through to W, and there's some gaps in those letters. So I just run that at the bottom, and we get W here. 
you see, it's like sign W, the number or the position 20. Hmm. W is not the 20th position in the English alphabet. It's the 23rd position, right? That's because there are some missing things. We don't have any, any um, Quentins or Quincy's or anything like that. Nobody with a name starting with Q. Um, and there's some others missing as well. There's no Florence's or Fiona's um, starting with F and things like that. So those gaps means that dense rank doesn't really give us exactly what we were looking for here. Um, so you need to be kind of careful with this character data and think about what it is you're trying to represent. Another way we could approach this is rather than trying to dense rank them, is just map them to the ASCII character codes. So we can use the ASCII function. Now, unfortunately, A is actually 65. Um, so I'll just subtract that off to give us the values 1 to 20. Seven, and we can do that. We can split them into buckets a bit more evenly. And we can see this final bucket um, covers the final positions in the alphabet. Now, just a kind of final general thing on um, character data like this. So, which bucket decides how it's going to split up these values and which bucket each letter is going to go in? Now, um, as you probably know, Words are not evenly distributed by starting letter in the English language, right? Some letters have much more common um, just in general than others, and um, particularly for a starting letter. For example, there's very few words which start with the letters um, X, Y, and Z. Okay, they are pretty rare. So you might want to make those final letters of the alphabet and kind of group them all together. So quite often, you might want to write your own kind of custom bucketing function to ensure that letters um, have a more kind of distribution relating to their language distribution rather than their strict values actually stored in the tables. All right, so that's kind of what I was going to cover up to here at this point. Questions, comments, thoughts at this point, anything? Okay, so let's just kind of recap those kind of quickly. So I've there's a couple of ways we can name these. We could call them binning functions or bucketing functions. Um, depending on the terminology and what you're reading, you might see them called either. And there's two main functions in, available in Oracle Database, so intile and whip bucket. Intile distributes the rows, so we get an equal number of rows in each bucket or bin. Whip bucket distributes the values, so each interval is the same size, but there could be a different number of rows in each. Now, one thing I didn't explicitly call out, but hopefully some of you actually noticed as we kind of went through the examples and the uh, demo. Entile is a analytic function, right? So you have to have the over clause and it has to have an order by. So you have to say how you are sorting the data in order to use Entile. You can also partition the data as well. You can have partition by order by, should you really wish to but you have to have the order by in order to use the entire. With bucket on the other, other hand, I didn't have the over clause. And in fact, it's impossible to have the over clause um, with with bucket. We cannot turn that into an, in excuse me, into an analytic, okay? So if you're using it to kind of chart or group your data, we have a subquery where you calculate which what bucket each value is in, and then outer query where you actually group them up and do whatever it is, whatever magic you need to do with those actual values. Okay, so entiles and analytic, with bucket is not. Okay, subtle thing, but important to be aware of. Um, next thing we're talking about character data. Because with entile, we just got an order by. If you can sort by it, then you can use it with entile. So if we want to sort by name and split them up, so quarter the rows in each thing, we can use entile. Width bucket, on the other hand, does not accept strings. So if you've got character data you want to split up, you've got to do something first to assign them to values to figure out which bucket it belongs to. So subquery to compute numbers, and then pass that to width bucket. And just kind of recap in terms of what the typical, the classic chart type you would use if you're representing the output of these visually, Entile maps to a box and whisker plot. Um, at least, certainly, if you're doing quartiles, um, whereas width bucket represents a classic histogram. Okay. Now, there's lots of charts which have 
look very similar but actually have slightly different names. Um, but in terms of pure keeping it simple, that's what they would map to. Okay, so the question come in, are these functions available on 11G? Yes, they are available on 11G. I, I don't even know which version they came in actually. They've been around for as long as I can remember, to be honest. Um, I would say if you are on 11G, you really, really should be thinking about upgrading like now, right? Like yesterday, okay? Um, it's very, you know, this is a, even 11.2 is what more than a decade old now. I really strongly say you need to be thinking about upgrading, okay? All right, so that kind of um, covered those ways of bunking, bunking data. You're on the path to 19C, that's good to hear, great. Um, there's actually another interpretation we could have for consistent um, groups or consistent buckets. And that's where we want to fix the size of each bucket. So with end tile and width bucket, Generally, we've either been working with a fixed data set or ones where we know what the upper and lower bounds are. You know, if for width bucket, if we're going to do things like student grades in an exam, we know what the highest and lowest values are. We'll just generate centiles or people's ages, things like that. Um, and we know how many buckets we want. Sometimes we know what size we want the bucket to be, but not how many buckets in total there will be, right? Um, and a classic example of this is if you want to split the data up into uh, time intervals, for example, five minute intervals, six minute intervals, 10 minute intervals, things like that. And again, we might want to do this as a number of rows as well. So get groups of five rows, 10 rows, so on and so forth. So whether you want to do this based on the number of rows or the values themselves, the approach is kind of basically the same. Um, we can use this little formula here. So you take, you divide the value that you want to bucket up. If we're going to do it by rows, we'll assign row numbers first. Divide through by the interval and then multiply back up by the interval. Now, I've used floor here. You could also use the ceiling. So floor is remove the fractional components, so round down. So 2.75 would go down to 2. Seal rounds up, so 2.75 would go to 3, 2.1 would also go to 3. Which of these exactly you use will depend on what, what you want the starting point is. You know, how do you want your ranges to work? Do you want 0 to be the starting point or do you want 1 to be the starting point? Right? You need to think a bit about that. Um, as I say, the interval is the group size, so the number of rows or the range of values. And you don't always need to actually multiply back up by the interval. You only need that if you're going to then display the information back to the user. So this is when I jump back to more demo and show this how this all works again. Um, so this time what I'm going to do, generate some random values, and I want n rows in each bucket. So in this case, my n here is five, five rows in every bucket. So first, I'll just use row number to assign numeric values, starting at one, so one, two, three, four, five up to however many rows we've got. Um, and then we'll use the ceiling function here. Uh, you say you could use floor, you could use ceiling. You need to think about what your boundary conditions are. And just dividing the row number we've generated by the interval, um, and that will give us five rows in each group. Let's execute that, and there you go. You see count is five, although I'm generating a random number of rows each time. So if we run this a couple of times, you'll see the final bucket just contains the overflow, however many values there are left over. Um, so if I run this a few times, we'll see yeah, four rows in the last bucket, we get a slightly different number each time, back to two again, and so on and so forth. And the thing is, because I've actually selected n, or we can made it by variable, um, I can now change this. If I want 15 rows in each group, I'll just change that to 15, run the whole thing again, and there we go, boom. Got 15 rows in each group, uh, five in the last one. Or I could change it to 25 and get 25, or we could even do you know, something slightly unusual, seven rows per group. The key thing here is we're just taking um, our row number and dividing it by our interval. And then all you have to do is group by that to give you that many rows in each group. Um, so now let's do it by value. 
principle is exactly the same. Generate a thousand bar, uh, rows, one from zero to a hundred. Our interval size is five here. So this time, you see, I'm using floor. Um, so that will give us from zero up to, but not including five, and five up to, and so on and so forth. And multiplying it back up, so we can actually see what the start point of each interval is. Right. So we've got zero to five, five to ten, yada yada yada, and we see how many rows there are in each group. So let's just show that with um, dates. Now, with times, it, does, it gets a bit messy, and this is more about the date manipulation um, itself, but the actual principle is the same. So this is our start date, um, or this is our start date here, I should say, you know, 1st of September. Um, and we want to pull out, extract how many minutes there are after that start date, and then divide by our interval and multiply up. So again, I've got a five minute interval, so we can go through that. I can change that to something a little bit crazy, wacky, like nine minute intervals and so on. Now, this is something you do have to be kind of careful because you notice I'm trunk, I'm, um, including the date as part of the grouping here. If you've got things that cross days and you want nine minute intervals um, uh, across days, Right, so it's every nine minutes starting from the first of uh, September forevermore. Um, you need to do something a bit more funky, a bit more clever than I've done here, and actually do the minutes since this very first starting point. Okay, so when you've got uh, times that cover multiple uh, periods, you need to think a little bit carefully about how exactly this is going to work. Now, usually you'll do something like five minutes or six minutes or 10 minutes, which all divide into an hour nice and evenly. Um, so actually a lot of the time you won't notice. It's only if you use a unit that doesn't divide into 60 nice and easily. Uh, just, just a like, side interesting point. Um, some people wonder why we actually have 60 minutes in an hour. And it comes from, I believe from like the Babylonian system. Um, and they tended to use base 60, which has a, Great property that it divides equally by two, three, four, five, six, ten, fifteen, twenty, and thirty. Right? It has a lot of values which it divides through evenly, whereas base ten only actually got two and five, and that's it. Um, so, you know, it's like an interesting, just a little interesting side thing. So we can do five, and we go six minute intervals as well. You'll see it'll bring it up to the hour. We won't get minutes past the hour. Okay, so that's, um, we've generated split into five, six minute, whatever intervals. There is a little problem with this approach, right? Very subtle, slightly subtle problem with these. Um, does anyone can spot or guess exactly what this is? So you can see um, I'm getting each time period, you know, six minutes, Six, twelve minutes past, eighteen minutes past, twenty-four minutes past, and so on. There's little trap we can fall into here. When doing this, I've assumed that um, there isn't value or is a row for every time period, right? So I've generated a thousand rows crossing 120 minutes. It's pretty much certain that that's going to happen. Um, let's generate a much far fewer rows. I'm just going to generate 10 rows each time, covering a two hour time period again, split them in five minute intervals. And you'll see that actually, oh, interesting. We don't start on the hour, we start 10 minutes past, and then we go only actually to one o'clock. If I run this a few times, you can see from, we've got, okay, on the hour to five minutes past, 15 past, 20 past, 40 past, 45 past, on the hour, one to 105. We've got gaps in our time periods here, right? Um, is this a problem? I mean, quite possibly, right? You know, um, quite often if people are asking for this kind of time breakdown, they want to show five minute intervals, they still want to see the intervals where there's no entries, right? You know, if you've got, you know, you want to show orders taken on your website and you've got an outage for whatever reason, um, a five minute outage for whatever reason, they would still like to see that. You don't want a missing data in your chart there. You still want to show a row with no information, with no entries. 
So rather than doing all this kind of crazy um, funky formula nonsense, it's probably better to generate the intervals. So I'm just um, got my table selecting some values here. I want to say the two hour intervals starting from this time, or five minute intervals covering a two hour time period starting from this bound. And then generate that many rows. Okay. So if I just, actually, I'll, I'll just do this second so you can see what's going on here. Um, so I'm just generating a row for each interval in that time period. I will then outer join the data set to it, my that data. So let's put that back in. So let's imagine this, I'm generating it randomly here, but let's imagine that is our order data or uptime data or whatever it is that you actually want to split into the time periods. So I've got my groups for the intervals we generated, and then we're outer joining the real, the real data to it, where they fit within that time period. So we run that, you can see we now got every single time period and the missing ones appear with zero, okay? So if you are asked to do things like split stuff into n rows or, well, n values, time periods or values, it's very, very likely that actually what you want to do is this instead, rather than use that formula, is generate the full data series with all the time periods and then how to join your actual um, customer data or whatever it is to that. Otherwise, you can end up with gaps in your data. And I'll do the same here, just with the values 0 to 100, um, generate that out. So we want to do it by value as well. And we've got some groups there too. So that is what I was had to cover day on all of that. Um, any other questions, comments, thoughts before I you know, wrap up, do a bit of a summary on this? <laughs> Use cases for percentile disk and ratio to report functions. Okay. Um, percentile disk is, yeah, um, I'll have to double, off the top of my head, I can't really remember percentile disk, but it's, Think about that one. Ratio to report is um, a bit easier to kind of explain. Let's what we want to do with ratio to report is essentially saying uh, x over order by x. Um, so what we're doing is uh, I've done something wrong there. Oh no, it's just over. I don't want that order by. So you're saying what percentage? this value is of the total. Um, so in fact, it is kind of the same as x divided by sum of x over. These should be the same. So they're, yeah, they're producing percentages. You can see, hopefully you can see, that these are in fact the same value. Um, so what you're saying is this value, so let's pull out all the values, pull, pull out all the values and their totals. So you can see what's going on here. Um, I don't want to type one, I want to type X. There we go. So what percentage of 55 is X, is one? So one divided by 55 is whatever, 1.8%, 1, 1, 1, 1.8, 1.8, 1.8%, and so on and so forth. So that's what ratio to report is doing. And it's, it's, it's the same as this, right? X divided by the sum. Um, could use one or the other, you know, this one is kind of making your in intent a bit clearer, I think, because that's what its purpose is. Um, but you could use either. So that helps with ratio to report. Centile disk, um, I'll have to think about that one a bit more. If anyone's got any um, uh, insight or thoughts on that, please let us know, because it's not one I use very often. Will you share this SQL script? Yes, I will share the script, so um, stay tuned. I'll Got some links coming up in a minute. All right, any other questions, comments? All right, let's. Okay, let's, let's just recap. All right, so we've seen various ways we can bucket or bin rows, split them into groups. As we saw, n tile, you get the same number of rows, plus or minus one in each group, and it is an analytic function. You have to have the over clause with an order by in it. Okay, otherwise it won't work. 
So it sorts the data and then splits. So you've got an even number of rows in each group. Width bucket is not quite the opposite, but it's saying between this upper and lower bound, create n equal sized intervals. So each bucket covers the same number of values, not the same number of rows. And this is not an analytic function. We explicitly cannot use the over clause with it. So typically with width bucket, or actually quite often with both of them, the other subquery to calculate the group, and then an outer query to group by the group um, to then sum or count or whatever it is you're going to do with the values for each one. So those work, as I said, if you know exactly how many buckets you want, or you want know what the, you're working with a fixed data set, or you know the total size of things. In cases where you want you know how big you want each bucket to be, either in terms of values or number of rows, but you don't know the total number of buckets because you don't know how big data set is so time example time data is a classic example because you just go i want from um yesterday until now and now keeps moving on we can use a formula like this so we just use the floor or the ceiling of value divided by the size of the interval and if you want to go back to um the bounds of those just multiply back up so that works but quite often um Certainly, if you've got sparse data where there's periods that are missing rows, what you really want to do is generate the intervals first. So create a data set containing every, a row for each interval and then L to join your um, data to that. Then you want to split into those groups. So in terms of the scripts and things you want to see, um, so this first one, Entile versus Width Bucket, that's actually from Martin D'Souza. Um, he's, you know, big community advocate. Um, he explain, talks about these in a bit more detail, just covers these over, um, how these work. You want the scripts from this session. That's this live SQL script there. So check that out um, and have a fiddle with those. And if you just want to know a bit more about SQL, it's always worth pointing out over in Oracle Dev Gym, um, we have a new weekly quiz, new database quiz covering all sorts of things, SQL, PL SQL, um, various other database topics. But we've got massive, massive library, a huge back catalog of like 500 odd SQL quizzes, uh, like I think nearly 2000 PL SQL quizzes. So if you're looking to practice and learn Oracle database and SQL, really recommend you check those out and seeing how those work. Okay, so um, another question, comment, come in. This floor formula looks similar to ratio to report. Um, no, because ratio to report is saying um, what's the overall total. Sum up all the values and calculate what those are, and then what percentage that value is. Okay. Whereas the formula you're saying um, we're normalizing it. Okay. So that floor formula is a normalization to a particular unit. So we're going in intervals of five, or ten, eleven, whatever it is you want to be. Ratio to report is saying this value, what percentage is it of the total? Okay, they, they might look a little bit similar, but they do very different things. Um, probably best you just kind of fiddle around with those and play with them um, to kind of help get to grips with what those details are, help you understand. All right, any final last questions or comments before we wrap up? No, nope. in that case, uh, as I say, it's always, it's always great to see you. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. More importantly, I hope you learned something. If you've got things that you would like to know, topics you'd like to cover in the future, just reach out to me. Um, there's some other things in the wings. Um, someone reached out to me asking for things about optimizer transformations. So I'm not sure if I'll cover that. I'll either cover that next month or November. I'll see what else is going on and what we've got time for. In the meantime, otherwise, stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully, Maybe we'll actually get to meet in person sometime next year. All right, goodbye.